Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks so much to Braintree and um, Shy, Hack, Shy Hack Night for hosting us. I, before I get into the presentation, I'm going to play video with no sound because we deal with a lot of visual concepts and I feel it is easier to incept your brains by showing you who we are and what we do while I speak. Um, so my name is Maria Demopoulos and I am the board chair of the Wabash Lights uh, and that's a volunteer role that feels a lot of times like a full-time job where I spend a lot of my days and nights. Um, but in my day job, um, I lead a consulting firm called The Advisors and I come from the philanthropic and impact measurement space. So uh, before Wabash Lights, I had worked at a few foundations as an evaluator, so it was my job to kind of build um, different frameworks to measure social impact. Uh, which meant, as a lot of you guys can relate, uh, a lot of data analysis, a lot of um, data visualization, a lot of banging your head against a wall, and a lot of wanting to connect to things that were difficult to measure, but that made me feel a lot. Um, and that's how I kind of came to be a member of the Wabash Lights, uh, through Jack and Seth, who are the co-founders. Um, and I'm going to tell you about them. And I thought that I would be going a lot slower, <laughs> so we are not going to see the end of this video. So I would like to tell you a little bit about um, us as an organization, me, um, but it starts with the story of two guys. I will also warn you guys that this has absolutely no charts or graphs <laughs> or any sort of data. So suffer, nerds, <laughs> boom. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. It's, you know, after 6 p.m. Uh, so this is a story of two guys, um, uh, Seth and Jack. Oh, it's going to auto-scroll. So Seth is this one, and Jack is this one. Jack is a filmmaker based here in Chicago. Uh, he's made a lot of good films about the food space and a lot of documentaries about the failures of the international aid space. You should check them out. They're on Netflix. Uh, and this is Seth Unger. He is a design strategist. And this whole project began about seven years ago with these two friends in um, New Orleans. And they were walking around New Orleans and they were talking about art and how the city made them feel alive and how you change as a human when your built environment is different. Um, and then they started thinking about public art and the way that public art is done um, and sort of thought about this idea that public art is most frequently like a single benefactor and a single artist and they will sometimes choose a, a city, a location, a living place and say, here is an art, you are welcome. Bye, <laughs> and then you guys kind of have to live with it. Uh, and they were thinking that that was sort of unfair and started wondering about how might our cities look if we put the public in public art, which is a cool tagline and has the fortunate feature of being something that is important and true to us as an organization. Um, I just put this in here to troll them because I look really nerdy. Uh, so they came up with the idea of creating Chicago's first interactive public, public arts platform. Uh, and you might be wondering what that is. Part of this is since we sit at kind of the nexus of technology and art, um, sometimes the abstraction can get difficult. That's why I was like, I'll play a video. I'll show you. Oh, man, this is really stealing my thunder. Um, so uh, they wanted to essentially create this public arts platform. And we say platform because it's interactive and any member of the public can interact with it. And what it is really just kind of functionally is putting, oh, thank you so much, Soren. That would be very helpful. Um, so what are the Wabash lights? It's essentially putting programmable LEDs on the underside of public infrastructure. And they chose to begin um, the Wabash L tracks. So taking an iconic piece of public infrastructure um, in a kind of interesting space. We'll get into that site selection in a bit. Uh, and thinking about, well, how can we use the, de the design constraints of the built environment to put lights up there? And then how can we find the sweet spot of how to make that interactive and accessible? Um, and that's where they were at. And that's how I came into the picture. So my background was in building and scaling nonprofits and in kind of measuring, measuring things. Uh, and so I kind of came in to help us grow from this group of two people into this group of 25 people, people and this community. Um, so essentially, we've grown in seven years from those two friends into a thriving 25-member volunteer-run organization and a community of technologists and artists kind of all throughout the city. 
And what I'd like to use my time to do is talk to you about how do we go from two people to this larger community um, and sort of how has our project evolved, what have been some of the constraints and difficulties that we faced, and how do I think um, you guys at Chai Hack Night could potentially kind of help us think through some of these bottlenecks in a breakout session that will not be tonight. Um, okay, so in thinking about this, often when we talk to groups, they get really excited because it can run in a bunch of different directions. As soon as they understand that the lights themselves can respond to uh, vibration, to motion, to visual stimulus, to um, music, people kind of run in a bunch of different directions. They can be like, oh, so this can do a, a million different things and could be scaled to 15 different blocks and it could be funded a million different ways. And that was one of the primarily, like one of the first difficult things about this project um, was in trying to figure out which constraints to use. So we chose, as I said before, um, public infrastructure in the built environment. Uh, one of the things that was difficult for me is that the two co-founders had done a Kickstarter and they successfully raised $110,000 to crowd raise to support um, this public arts project, which is really, really cool. Um, but the downside is it's like a million dollars a block, so we needed a long way to go. <laughs> and usually, as probably some of you guys know, if you want to raise a bunch of money, you go into a quiet seed raise and then you go public for the last 10%. We kind of had to invert that to go from a very public um, Kickstarter and then try to figure out how do we operationalize, what does it look like for us to be a 501c3, um, and then how do we raise all of that money now that we've kind of already gone public. So that was a difficult thing. The other thing was feasibility, right? So if you're thinking about putting art on public infrastructure, we'll get to the community layers in just a moment and the civic piece of this, but we just needed to know that they could survive on the track. So this meant one permissions. We had to get permissions from every different person you can imagine, CDOT, CTA, um, holler if these acronyms don't make any sense. Um, <laughs> CDOT, Chicago Department of Transportation, uh, Chicago Transit Authority, um, the mayor's office, Department of Cultural Affairs, et cetera. And then also we had to work with a bunch of engineers to put the lights on the actual tracks and test them to make sure that they could survive the vibration. So uh, as you know, the tracks, the trains are loud and they cause a lot of vibration and we were really concerned that they were just gonna vibrate all the way off the tracks. What's really cool about this, perhaps for this audience, is that the vibration, the vibration testing we did, um, we actually worked with Philips to improve their product line. They used that data, one, it was great to know that they worked and to know like at what rate they fall off and need to be replaced, but also then to inform the rest of their strength testing for the rest of their lighting lines, which I think is a cool point of interest, but perhaps a little bit in the weeds. Um, so that was the funding piece, um, so, sort of some of the challenges. The next um, challenge was really around, <laughs> those mugs, was really around um, site selection. So Chicago is a really um, bright, vibrant you know, city, uh, an extremely diverse city, and so it was like, well, why would we choose Wabash Lights? And when we looked at a bunch of different um, community project sites, uh, we chose Wabash to start, and we'll talk in a bit about different site selections that we're looking at in the future, um, but essentially because you sort of have this cultural corridor here on Michigan Avenue where you have millions and millions of people every year. You've got Millennium Park, you've got the Art Institute, and then you have sort of an industrial corridor on State Street where you have a lot of shopping, where a lot of us spend our time. And then you kind of have dead space in between that's somewhat dark um, and underused uh, in, on Wabash. You also have, as we know, um, falling engagement rates in the loop. A lot of people who work in the loop bail at 5 p.m. So there's like a spike during the day and then it just completely empties out. Um, but what we also found out is that it happens to be situated in one of the largest college campuses in the United States because there are like five different universities and colleges that are there. So you have a huge student population. You have a thriving um, residential population. Uh, and you have a bunch of tourists. So they thought with Wabash, if we could light up this space, this dark space, um, you know, we can move people over here. There are also a bunch, we've done two economic impact reports. Um, one we did with an external evaluator, which was great. The other one was done by Chicago Loop Alliance that independently validated our data, which was really cool. Um, but essentially, we know that everyone comes into this place on Michigan and then they go north. Nobody goes west. They all go to the river walk, they hang out there, and really none of that feeds west. So that was the other thing. We also happen to know that if you light up a space and if you make it engaging, there are benefits to residents, right? The way that you feel, the way that you interact with your space, that's pretty cool and self-evident. Um, we know that there are like safety facts. We know that there are student engagement facts and that's really cool. But that's not um, the primary reason why I chose to become involved with this. 
And that's actually really about how you engage with the world around you. So the idea is we built out this functionality, and we'll talk a lot about the functionality, um, where anyone can text the lights, right? So anybody can interact with and walk up to and text a pattern or a sequence to the lights above, and they'll reflect whatever's happening. But we can also partner with artists, preferably from Chicago, but world-renowned artists. We have ideas of who these should be, um, who can curate light shows, right? And it's cool because it gives them a fair amount of constraint, um, but it also presents a little bit of a Pandora's box. Uh, and so the idea is that you can have a world-renowned artist who's driving traffic to the city, who's doing something beautiful and innovative up above, and then any resident, any student can come and actually interrupt that and have their voice take precedent. Um, and I think that that's a valuable and an important principle um, that kind of begs the question of how, what we might look like if we really you know, gave the power to create art to every person. Um, and I think that's powerful. So that's the site selection. The next really difficult thing about this was the constituent layers and how you, you know, how you approach civic engagement. <clears throat> so as I said before, we've got to work with CDOT, Chicago Loop Alliance, we have to work with SSA funds, residents, students, the aldermen, et cetera. Um, and that's really difficult, especially when you start thinking about from the perspective of the public or the perspective from funders, how we mitigate and manage the interactivity. So we want to create and maintain um, a nonpartisan environment where like we really hear everyone. You also want to make sure that nobody's just texting middle fingers to the lights or I'm sure we can imagine worse like exploding tiger genitals, <laughs> for instance. Um, so it's difficult to kind of maintain uh, that ambiguity <clears throat> appropriately. There's also a bunch of like security um, you know, issues there. There's also like accessibility issues. So we want to make sure that people aren't having seizures if they walk under the lights, that it's not disrupting traffic. So you have to do all that feasibility testing, um, which means that you have to aggregate different data, data sources and validate it that way, um, which is difficult, but you know, can be done. Um, the other thing, oh, I included this silly slide, was around what kind of interactivity we did. This is before my time, but we initially thought we would build an app. And that was in 2016. And we were like, let's build an app for people to interact with the lights. And then great, I'm grateful <coughs> that we very quickly decided, no, let's definitely not do that, because that's a huge barrier um, to entry and accessibility. So of course, we nixed that. Um, what we did instead do is partner with DePaul University. They've got the School of Computation and Design. <coughs> so we partnered with their faculty and with their students. And we said, if we say that we want to put the public in public art, what does that mean if we actually create the platform and the sandbox for you guys to play around and you guys play around? So they built out two mobile lights demos. Um, I think that those, this is one of them, these lights here, that's the second one. Um, they're mobile. You can take them into galleries, into offices, into you know, cultural spaces, et cetera. Um, and anybody can interact with them. And then we had the students themselves design what the functionality should look like. And they're the ones who came up with the text the light functionality, um, <clears throat> which is you can touch, you can text any color. So it can be like peach or cream or black or periwinkle or a bunch of weird colors I've never heard of. Um, the second thing that they came up with was projection mapping, uh, which is really, really cool. And the third thing was kind of um, motion activity. So the lights are kind of layered vertically in a, in a sequence, and then there's a screen. And one of my favorite things is when kids interact with these, they just like, I'm not going to do it here. But they dance in front of them a lot, and they'll kind of move around, and you can see your motion reflected in the mobile lights unit. Um, and so that's really, really, really wonderful, and that partnership um, really came through DePaul University, and then the tech was built out by TableXI here in Chicago. Um, they've donated all of their tech and all of their technical talent, which we are really, really grateful for. Um, and Comcast, got to give a shout out to Comcast, they helped us as well. So they helped us with the interactivity piece. So those were kind of the constraints that we had to build around and think around. Um, they raised the money, they did the feasibility testing, they did that for 18 months, and then we're now pushing through to two things. One, finish the capital campaign to actually get the lights up, which is fantastic, and two, build out our community programming. The community programming piece is, okay, cool. You know, coming from philanthropy, you often see things that are endowed that go up in a public space, and then five years later, you're like, who actually from this community signed off on this? Who cares about this? Is it well maintained? Does it still have a life? Are people still interacting with this? So we've had to be really thoughtful about programming around the lights. Um, and so out of that, we've built our STEAM curriculum, which is STEM plus arts. Um, and the STEM curriculum is essentially built on the idea that I think 
especially in education, although it's changing, there's a push to either kind of embrace the analytical side of yourself or the kind of creative and artistic side of yourself. And we believe that that's uh, a false dichotomy and an inappropriate bifurcation. So the idea is really to build a curriculum that helps students at a young age, we've targeted third through fifth grade to begin with, to think through how do you take a single idea and understand that as substrate independent. So how do you see a math, like a single idea, whether it's artistic or whatever, and see that expressed as a line or a mathematical input? How do you see it expressed uh, visually as a series of patterns of colors? Um, or how do you see that expressed in motion or in movement? Um, and the way that we've done that is by again partnering with DePaul. So uh, DePaul has built out these small mobile lights units that are even smaller than our current mobile lights units. The idea is for groups of students, three to five, kids at a time, they can so far manip manipulate the, the variables of light, color, pattern, keep it simple, to input and create small light shows that then they all come together, because there are a bunch of stations in each room, so they all come together and create a collective light show. Um, the grand vision for this is once the actual um, lights are fully installed, for students to be able to go from anywhere in the city and say, oh cool, like here's our light show, um, and do you know curated CPS student content on the on the infrastructure so that's um, that's pretty cool that's also been one of the difficult and frustrating things um, we're really grateful to have partnered with the Paul they've got an incredible team Nathan is the computer scientist who we work with he's also one guy who's like single-handedly designed and built these prototypes which is difficult um, so where we're at right now is trying our grant with the Paul is ending and we need to pivot to get into CBS CPS schools we're piloting three schools in the fall but between now and then, we have to really like hone and test these prototypes to make them student proof, which is no small feat. Um, and it's quite difficult. Uh, and that's one thing where I think we could use the help potentially of some of the tech talent in here to help us kind of, um, one, look at our existing prototypes, two, figure out uh, all the different ways that they could go wrong, and then three, help us hone in on whether or not we'd want to add an additional variable. Um, so that's kind of our, our STEAM programming and then our community engagement and that's where we partner with organizations co like museums, cultural institutions, etc. talk with them. And then the kind of last thing um, is sort of our project expansion. So having gone from where we, you know, we've been, we really have started thinking about Wabash Lights, for all the reasons I've described, Wabash Quarter is a phenomenal place, but Chicago is a big place, and are we really making good on the promise to like put the public in public art, and like whose public are we talking about, and how is that representative of our city? So we've really set to look at different sites throughout the city, um, and the idea would be, with um, the support of a benefactor, um, <coughs> to look at 10 sites across the city uh, where you build sister installations in the loop and in these communities. Uh, and the idea there is really for us to be, again, um, the sandbox for the platform and the communities themselves to design the installation. So it's opening it up beyond just trains um, to look at any piece of public infrastructure. And then it's putting parameters around which specific lighting materials we would use or which cons specific constraints you can use. But really then opening it up to the community to let them, the communities, um, to let them have a set fund of money and then build it from the ground up. Um, and decide for themselves which pieces should be consistent across site installations um, and how they would look and interact. Uh, and that is the Wabash Lights. That's my whole spiel. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, are you able to speak a bit about how you're mapping the motion data from the phones to the patterns that the lights are doing? No. No. Uh, uh, I can speak to it um, at a high level. I'm not the person who's built it out, so not in a bunch of detail. I know that the lights themselves have the controller, and they're controlled by a system called Pharos. And then we did a custom build through Table XI that controls um, basically like the, the palette control. In terms of the motion stuff, I think that the students just hooked it up to an Xbox Connect and are using that. Oh, so, so it's, it's, it's a camera. Yeah. So it's not a phone. Oh, sorry, that's the t so there are two different displays. There are two different units. So the text the lights works as expected. The motion sensor is for a separate mobile lights unit. So it's a totally different set. And I don't know how it works with the camera, no. I have sorry. some follow-ups ask you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good presentation. Do you have any plans <clears throat> of when you're going to begin the, this particular um, project on the west side? 
of the cell sites? Yeah, so the way that we've, the community engagement piece and the site selection is the most important and technically challenging piece of it. Um, the most challenging piece is the funding, so close funding, and then the idea is um, to work across a bunch of different stakeholder groups to build um, site selection criteria. So how do we look that um, it's like, there's an appropriate piece of infrastructure, um, that there's a strong civic um, like chamber of commerce that can support and maintain the project in perpetuity and so forth. Um, but we're looking across the south and west sides, um, as I said, at like 10 different sites. And in terms of uh, length and speed of rollout, it takes about 18 months at a time. I think he's got one more question. 18 months at a time is the idea to install um, each specific project and you'd really only be able to do one or two per year. So it's gonna be a slow rollout. What is the current and anticipated, this is actually fairly related, what is the current and anticipated community or city reaction to the installation of the Wabash lights? Yeah, so I think, again, this is re related to your question. Um, I don't think that it is my position or place to anticipate the reactions of others. My hope is for excitement, but I think the important thing is to do the long, slow work of creating forums for people to speak in their own voices and to collect feedback that way. And so that's why, to that end, for the beta test, we did, I think, like three different town halls and like 15 different community pop-up uh, and activation events. And for each of those sites, you'd have to do the same. And that's really why I think the community piece, the community site uh, installation piece, is harder, un undoubtedly harder, um, but we think, and I believe, um, the right way to do this, to go slowly to make sure that the communities are bought in and have a say. Uh, so two questions. Uh, one is, so in the full Wabash Lights installation, uh, what is the planned length of that for these four bars? Yeah, thank you. Um, I should have said that. So the original idea uh, in installation was, so it's four blocks, so it's $1 million per block, per block. So the first idea is walk before you can run, get one block funded. And that was the, the Wabash Lights. And then there's sort of this idea of from Wabash and Monroe down to Roosevelt, there's that stretch of Wabash Lights. Um, and that's kind of the core concept. Um, there's interest in potential funding um, around a much bigger installation across the entire loop. Uh, but that is very TBD. And I think that I would actually put it to you guys and love to hear your thoughts. Um, what's the kind of like marginal return on doing the same thing block after block? And so at that point, I think it's interesting to try to like mix up the design. And then a small technical question. Are the lights uh, addressable uh, on a per bar mm -hmm. or sub bar? Sub bar, yes, great question. So there are four bars and each bar, each meter I think is, oh, I should know this, I think it's like 83 pixels. So it's down to the pixel level. Um, yeah, so you can get pretty granulated um, in that you can see really beautiful like glittery, glittering light effects. It can be kind of ambient lighting, so you look like you're kind of shimmering in underwater or daylight, um, but not so granular that you can see a middle finger. Um, <laughs> right, the other thing is um, with different installations, they're looking at the possibility of using different lights. So you could potentially use something like light panels that reflect broader scenes, like you could put trees up so you'd see, you'd look up and see a forest instead of train tracks. Um, but that's for these guys. You talked about the types of potentially offensive things that could be submitted, things like that. What mechanisms do you currently have in place or do you intend to build out to prevent that sort of thing? Yeah, so I will give you the high, the easy breezy, and then the more honest, difficult answer. The easy breezy is kill switches, um, one, and like monitoring feeds. Uh, the harder question is like, I think one of the things that we would love to pool this community for is as we think about this broader expansion, um, talking with one, artist, but also um, attorneys. So we've, you know, we're in talks with an attorney who works on freedom of speech to really think about what that should look like. Um, and then also, how do you maintain this as a vehicle for public expression, um, where like, you know, what if this becomes a vehicle for protest? That could be a really beautiful thing, or it could be a really scary thing. So how do you put, again, how do you right size that level of engagement is what we think about a lot. I had a question regarding community engagement yeah. and rolling it out. With, who would own this? How do you raise money for it? Yeah, that's a, such a good question. Thank you. Um, so first, I'm going to address the who would fund it. So we thought really early on, should we go to city funding and DK's funding, 
or not, and we decided for two reasons not to do public funding. One, because we're a city that's got a lot of problems, and uh, that money can be better spent elsewhere, so this should be privately funded. Um, two, that also allows us to step outside of a lot of the administrative um, pieces that are really difficult around working. We'd still have to work with SSAs and Chamber of Commerces and Aldermen and D, uh, DKs and CDOT, but the funding piece makes that easier. The challenging piece is that it has put the onus on us as an organization to find and raise that money. So that's the funding side of it. Um, who would own it is the way that we are thinking about operationalizing this is, so the 501c3 owns the installation and it's privately funded in perpetuity um, with an endowment for programmatic stuff. The programmatic piece could ha has other funding life streams. Um, and then the communities themselves, we, so we look to hire people in the communities. It, each site selection has a project manager, manager and a project coordinator. So it's like, you know, local job creation, albeit temporary, um, in each of those pieces. And then there's a convening group that is actually coming together to build and determine the design specifications within um, parameters for each. Are you factoring in maintenance costs? Um, oh yeah, big time. So I kind of figured that this is not a uh, temporary uh, installation you tend to uh, keep it in the long term. So I'm just uh, wondering uh, what kind of uh, problems that you see sort of in the future and what sort of things that you are looking for in testing and uh, um, I guess repair. Yes, um, so the fast answer is maintenance costs are, fixed, are built into our budget. Um, we now know the burnout piece, at least for this line of lighting, um, the, the replacement for each like rate for each stringer of light. Uh, the cool thing about that uh, beta test that they did is they left it up for 18 months. So through that, you've been through a full Chicago winter. So anything that kind of could go wrong did go wrong. It was a long swath of like, so to your question, vibration, snow accumulation. One of the things that's really interesting to think about, especially as we consider partnering to do um, different um, like different kinds of lighting installations is like, what does snow accumulation look like? And then also, you know, this all goes completely differently once it goes live. So one of the things we're considering is how to phase out the build out. Because on the one hand, you want to maintain momentum and funding. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think you can learn so much from the first time it goes live. So the current idea, again, this is all like how the sausage is made is to do just the first Wabash Lights runner and then have that live and learn everything from that. Like user test it and see how everything goes there and then do the corresponding installation in one community and then do phase two would be like one block, one other block in the loop and one other block in another community and phase it out that way over five years. I'm sorry, what's that? I'm trying to, I think it might have, it was, I think it might have been actually. I, like I said, I mean, Philips, the lighting company, they were like, oh, this is really useful. <laughs> they like changed their lighting lines from it, yeah. You've been working, you've been working on this thing for a few years and I can only imagine what went through your head when you heard that they were going to light up the merchandise mart. Um, can you talk about your project in relation to the project uh, at the merchandise mart here? Yeah, as a private citizen and as a board member, the board president, um, I love Art on the Mart. I think it's great. Um, I think it's beautiful and I think that it is a, f you know, if we've thought a lot about like the progression of interactivity in public art. So you have the bean which is CloudGate, which is somewhat interactive in that you can go into it and you can look at it, but you don't really interact with it. Um, Crown Fountain is a beautiful example of public art that was not intended to be interactive, but it has become interactive because of the way children play in the water and the pool and splash around and it's taken on that life of its own. But there's no real thing, and Art on the Mark continues that, right? Um, and I think that that's a beautiful progression. I, I would like for us to add an additional layer of interactivity in that students can actually program that um, and the members of the public and that anybody can go and interrupt that narrative. I especially think it's like, again, it's one thing to say, you know, we want to see, oh, thank you. <laughs> we want to see like, what might the world look like if students see themselves represented in their communities? I think it's something different to say like, what if they actually built that? Like, what if they actually built the environment? They didn't just see themselves represented, but they built it from the ground up. And I think this is just a continuation of that. As a volunteer project, how many hours a week are generally being spent on this? So many, so many. We've never tracked it. And I've, like, the nerd in me has wanted to, and I'm also really 
glad that I haven't. Um, sometimes it's a full-time job. So it also started as like just Seth and Jack, and those guys poured their hearts and soul into this. And then it was just the three of us. And a lot of times it was like a full-time job, and I'm grateful that I've had the flexibility to not do it. Now that we've got a board of 25, we've tasked it out into like um, kind of agile working groups, and that makes it easier. But uh, so now it's really easy on people. Some people can show up and just work on for instance, if there are any interested volunteers, um, on the prototypes, it's like, you know, you spend a few hours a week for, and it's project-based, so that's easier, but a lot. Can you just talk a little bit about, I'm curious about the million dollars per block, like what is that, like are the lights themselves very expensive, or the installation, or permits, or? Yeah, um, great question. I will happily nerd out about this. Um, Million dollars per block is a little bit inflated. It includes maintenance cost, installation cost, blah, blah, blah. The supply chain piece of this is interesting to me and also tricky. The lights themselves are not expensive. They're pretty simple. Um, the expensive part is the controller. So the controllers are like $40,000 per controller, and that's the thing that controls the interface for each of them. Um, the licensing and permits are negligible. The maintenance is actually pretty, uh, pretty light, and that's another one of the cool things about this project is like how do you make something so simple that you can use it in a lot of different settings but still engaging. Um, from uh, like a governance perspective, one of the things that's interesting and tricky is the supply chain is sort of like each person has to be bought in in order for any person to be able to give you a discount, right? So if it's like the, if just the lights are taking something off their cost, like they're part of the supply chain, but the controllers and the installation and the maintenance and everything's not, then that's difficult. Obviously, the installation costs, the labor costs are fixed because those are um, unionized and should be paid appropriately. Um, so yeah. Quick question, what is the current status and then what is the timeline of the project? So the current status is we are <laughs> in Q1. Uh, so the, <laughs> the current status is TBD. Um, so we've raised several, thousand, several hundred thousand dollars and we've gotten several hundred thousand dollars more committed and then we are in the middle of pitching in this, in this conversation with a single individual donor who would scale it from like a one million dollar project to a, a like a, a 20 million, like a much, much bigger um, project. And so we'll know soon enough if that's gonna happen. Yeah. Seems like an Thank you guys. Thank you, Maria. <laughs>